Welcome to Trail and Ultra Running Training. My name is Will Franz. I'm a running coach and a strength coach, and the whole goal of this podcast is to help you train a little better so we can have fun and run a little more out on the trails. A lot has happened in the past week in ultra running, from David Roach breaking a big record to all sorts of things. Uh, but today, I want to talk about strength work. We can talk about some of the uh, more recent happenings in terms of food and training and all these things, because I think there's a really good conversation to have here about David Roach's performance um, in terms of food. And he's been really open about his increase in food, and I've been thinking a lot more about it, so that will be coming. But today, let's talk about strength work. And this is going to be the, like, eighth part in our, I believe, eight-part series about strength essentials and how to strength train well and how to just get stronger so that we can, we can run better. Now, if you appreciate any of this, I would really love it if you hit subscribe on whatever platform you're watching this on, because apparently that's the one that really matters. It shows that you want to see this on a repeat, so it will share it with other people or anything else you do, rating, review, etc. Thank you. Now, for strength training, we have gone through, I think, seven of these now. Uh, squat, push, pull, hinge, core stuff, power and plyometric training. And now we are up to how to put it all together, how to make a program. Now, this is not, I feel like this shouldn't need to be said, but this is not going to be detailed in terms of how it applies to you. This will not be everything you need to know about strength work. If you expect that, that's kind of a little silly. Like, I don't know you. People are different. We have different needs. My goals are different than a lot of the people I coach. So my strength training looks a lot different than a lot of the people I coach. And besides all that, like, I probably couldn't learn everything you do in 20 minutes. So probably not fair to expect that we're going to see the same the other direction. However, um, if we learn, as we learn a little bit more about the human body, there will be changes, there will be updates, and we can learn a lot and go a long way with what we know. And if you put together what we have discussed in this entirety of this eight-part series, which I think collectively is going to be somewhere between two and three hours, you're willing to experiment a little bit and you're willing to like commit to the process and practice and like push the weights kind of hard, then you will do really, really well. This is probably 80 to 90% of what you need, barring injuries or individual goals or whatever. This is probably 80 or 90% of what you need as a fairly active human, not even just as a runner, to stay fit in the gym. Now, I will always have a free program or two somewhere. There Currently, I have a 50K program out. Um, there are more coming. Some of them might cost money. Some of them will not. But there will always at least be a free one. I benefited from the education I got from other people, and I'm just trying to get back a little bit with my own flair. So no matter what, you should be at least able to find something on my site that provides some good examples of what we're talking about here. Now, you won't see... All of these principles applied in every program, that, but they'll be a decent starting point. So let's talk about programming and what you might find if you look at a strength program. And I can't speak to other people's strength programs. I see a lot of them. A lot of them are shit, but some of them are good, and it's hard to delineate or distinguish between the two unless you know what you're looking at. Now, if we're going to talk programming, we could either start big and go small, as in like how it fits into your year, and then down to the individual session. My brain doesn't like that as much, so we're going to go the other way. We're going to start small with the individual session, and then go big. So let's talk about how to plan a session. First, we're going to start with mobility work. And this is the thing that I either see too little or too much of. Like, there's the people who love the mobility work and spend a lot of time on it, or they came up when I did in the 90s and early 2000s and learned that you had to do like 15 to 20 minutes of mobility work before any sort of strength training thing or else your legs are going to fall off or something. I don't know. The amount of time that people spend on a foam roller is wild to me. If you enjoy it, that's great, but it's probably not necessary. And the amount of time that people complain about taking too long in the gym and then continue to roll on a foam roller doesn't match 
So let's probably put that thing away. We can do that at home with the almost the exact same amount of benefit and then get to work. Now when we look at mobility stuff, it is going to be a couple movements. I do not, much like PT, where yes, if you did 40 minutes of physical therapy post-injury every day, twice a day, you might heal a little faster. What's more likely to happen though is to look at a 40 minute list of movements and just be like, hey, I'm not going to fucking do any of this, right? So let's get like one or two movements that might actually be really valuable, help you move a little better, and put them in so that we have little, not even less risk of injury in the gym. I think the gym is, tends to be a fairly safe place if we have even a modicum of sense. However, uh, we might not be able to perform as well if we don't do some mobility stuff. So for example... I have slightly tight ankles, and my scapula don't like to move back down my back very well. So for me, a typical mobility session might be a banded ankle distraction, where I attach a band to a squat rack, place the other end above, right above my ankle, and lean into it super hard, creating a little more ankle flexion. And then some scapular pull-ups. I might do 10 to 12 of those to train my scapula to move downwards, and then we're going to be on with the day. Um, the more, the newer you are, the longer your mobility stuff might need to be. If you're super inflexible, we might need to spend a little more time. Very personally dependent. But yoga is lovely. Go take a yoga class. When we're in the gym, let's do the little bit we need to do so we can get in and get out. Next, if we're early in our lifting career, then I think we need to build some strength first. So this might not apply to you. And later in our lifting career, we might, and this might be a pretty consistent thing. I've developed, this is a more recent development to my thought process, but next we're moving into like power and plyo movements. Um, I think they're going to show up a lot more across my training instead of just specific times of year. And much like the mobility stuff, it's going to be one or two movements that really hit a target well and then we're going to be, and then I'll be able to stay powerful and poppy and reactive and explosive throughout an entire year, rather than kind of losing and regaining that adapta adaptation as we move through. Now, I think when it comes to these things, again, you have to have the strength to move quickly. If you can't do a squat well, then we probably shouldn't be doing a squat jump. Right? Like that makes sense to me. I hope it makes sense to you. But uh, once we've developed some of that strength adaptation, then we can integrate these a little more. And you'll see different representations of this in various programs I have on the internet. Once we've done a little bit of power and plyometric work, then we might do our then we would do our big strength movements. And then we'd move into some like accessory or supplementary training and then call it a day. Right? And this should probably take anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes, depending on how many sets, whatever weights you're trying to move, how strong you are, etc. Right? And when I say how strong you are, it's because like for me, for a, a deadlift, one of my better lifts, I have to do a few warm-up sets because it takes a little bit to build up to it. And it's not like those take a ton of time, but they still take time. And then unloading the bar takes time and all these things, right? So we have to realize that the stronger you get, the more you're probably time you're probably going to spend in the gym in order to maintain that strength. And that's okay. Now, if we have an example, the session above, from mobility to plyos to strength to accessories, it would be something like, as I said, ankle dorsiflexion work and scapular pull-ups. And then I might do like a trap bar deadlift or a hex bar. could also do a barbell deadlift, whatever works. And then I could do a like one arm half kneeling lat pull down. You could also do a seated thing. Um, and then I could do an incline bench press. This could be barbell or dumbbell. I tend to prefer dumbbell for this movement, but both work really well. And then some version of like a single leg squat pattern, be it Bulgarian split squats or walking lunges. Then some ab work. Let's call it like decline crunches. And then some accessory stuff like lateral raises. Um, I tend to do a little extra shoulder work than I need partially because my left one's separated so it just keeps it a little more solid. Um, I should probably do bicep work because I'm a climber and it would protect my tendons, but I hate it so I don't do it enough. Welcome to my weaknesses. Now, 
how many sets, reps, etc. We can phase in and out of different rep ranges. I'm going to get into this a little more as we talk about the yearly programming. But two to four sets of like three to 15 reps is great. It should vary throughout the year. All of it has value. Experiment with a little bit. Stick with something for a month and then move on and see what you find. Now, the part of that that people tend to screw up, we get caught on the sets and reps part and forget about the rest periods part. You should rest. When it comes to strength training, the rest really matters. You, If you just do everything in one big circuit, we're limiting the amount of strength we can develop. And it might feel like you're saving time, which you might be in a particular session, but you're wasting time in the long run because you are limiting how strong you get, so you're having to do a lot more work in order to make the same level of progress. Whereas you might be able to add 20 pounds to a lift in one week earlier in your in career if you just like hung out between sets. Maybe you only add five because you were so depleted that you weren't able to actually lift, right? So let's appreciate that the rest is probably valuable. Now, if you are really early in your career of lifting, then that's a little more lenient. Um, we'll get into this in a, in a minute, but you might not even be able to move a significant enough amount of weight yet that you can really create progress. And if we're there, then a little more circuit set, well-programmed, might make some sense. But once we're actually starting to be able to move an amount of weight that can make a real change, we should have some rest. Now, it said after a couple months, if you still don't need the rest between your sets, you should probably lift heavier. Because when I do a set of like good, worthwhile deadlifts that would actually lead to me making strength gains or even maintenance, I physically cannot do a set of good, worthwhile bench press in the rest period because they're both hard. And if I push them both hard, I just need to recover. So if you are not in your first couple months of lifting, where form, where weights are really light, and you are focusing on nothing but form, and the effort doesn't really matter yet, then lift heavier if you don't need the rest. The rest should be desired by the end of a good set. Now, from individual session to weekly, two times a week is usually good enough for most people, especially most runners. You'll hear everything from like three to four to whatever, and very honestly, if more people came in twice a week and lifted hard and actually did a good amount of work in the gym, they would probably see more progress than coming in and kind of lifting hard three to four times a week. If you want to be strong and live well and live a long, healthy life, then two, maybe three times per week is plenty. I'm not saying you can't do more. I'm saying that's enough. Now, if you want to get on a bodybuilding stage or become a competitive power lifter, then of course you have to lift more. That is a barbell sport. You will actually, much like running, we could, wouldn't expect to be somewhat competitive or decent as a runner by only running twice a week. Same thing with lifting. If lifting is our primary sport, we're going to be in there four or five, six times a week. But if lifting is a means to an end of being strong, having some muscle mass, living a good life, and running better, then two times a week is probably plenty. Now, we could also split it into smaller daily sessions, like a 15 minutes a piece where you only do two exercises. There are a hundred ways to do this. But two 45-minute sessions a week, a total of like 90 minutes a week, is probably enough for most people. Now, when we have two sessions a week, I also think it opens up more um, options, right, in comparison to one time a week. Because I think a lot of people could, if they went hard enough, make progress with once a week. But it's going to be slower. Um, we know just because of the ways muscles recover that you're not going to see as much development, you're not going to see as much progress as if we do twice a week because a lot of muscles are going to be fully recovered in that two to three day period. And then if we stimulate them again, rather than letting them like 
mildly atrophy for half of a week, then you will see faster progress. So two times a week also allows, in, in addition to faster progress, allows us to like have sessions be shorter without having to target as many different movement patterns and still get the same amount of benefit. All right, so if we did that session that I talked about from day one, instead of the, like, let's talk after the power and the plyos because that can be integrated. However, uh, we might, instead of a, like, deadlift on day one, we might do a front squat on day two. A big bilateral hinge movement replaced for a big bilateral squat movement. And then instead of a one-arm lat pull-down, maybe we do a bent-over barbell row. Um, this focuses on a horizontal pull instead of a vertical pull. It focuses on bilateral movement rather than unilateral. We could also get this from like pull-ups versus one-arm dumbbell rows, right? Then for an overhead press, you get this focuses on our vertical push instead of a horizontal from the bench that we were getting in that session one, right? We could use dumbbells, we could use barbells for either of these, whatever works. Then for accessory work, when it comes to abs, if we do ab flexion on day one, like those decline sit-ups, then we should probably hit some rotational oblique work on the other day. And then the accessory stuff is going to support whatever the individual person needs. For me, I might hit another round of shoulders to keep my separated shoulder better. Uh, somebody might hit extra chest if they really care about those things. This might be an arm farm period of the day. Whatever works for you, right? But this is kind of where... Um, we have a little bit of leeway. Now, lifting day is not recovery day. So when we talk about how this fits in a week, if we're doing two sessions, then you have to lift hard to see progress. So we're not really going to be recovering, right? Most people don't lift hard enough. Um, we know this because when They've done some studies and had people go to what they think is like one rep short of failure and then have them keep going. They do like five or six more reps. So most people don't know what failure means when it comes to lifting. And I don't even mean failure like you can't move the weight. I mean failure like form starts to degrade reasonably highly, right? So we go from an overhead press that's straight overhead to one where we're having a lot of this lean and push. That would be qualified as failure in my book for an overhead press. And for most people, they're not going to hit failure if we just go by how much it sucks to press that weight over your head, right? Like we are going to cut short because lifting hard is hard and it doesn't feel great all the time. Now, if we, so if we lift hard enough to make progress, make a significant amount of progress, then we're also going to run into the problem where we're not really recovering on that day, right? So we need to pair this throughout a week that it doesn't affect our big runs. Once you've lifted for a couple weeks, you will your body will just get used to the DOMS a little bit. It's going to take two, three, four weeks. I think a lot of runners try to add their strength training at a point where they're already running quite a bit or they do strength training for the first time in six months and they're like, oh shit, my legs hurt so badly. There's no way I could run now. This isn't really good. This means that it's going to really reduce my performance. Whereas we'd experience the exact same thing if you took a bunch of time off of running, came back to it, and immediately did a hard workout. Your legs would fucking hurt. So we should appreciate that maybe two, three, four weeks of commitment is necessary in order to develop the, I don't know, in order for our body to get used to the level of soreness and not honestly create as much soreness. It's not that you just get accustomed to it, it's that you actually get less sore because your body recovers faster, it gets used to using the protein. You probably eat a little better because you're tired and hungry and then we're just going to improve the recovery. But I expect the first week or two to be a little difficult, which is why I've heard people say there's never a bad time to add strength training and I absolutely disagree. I did a podcast on this. It actually lost me a couple followers, which made me chuckle. Um, and I really appreciate in some ways because like the title is stupid, but there are bad times to add strength training. And one of them is probably within six weeks of your race, because if you're within six weeks of your race, you're peaking, you're doing fine. You haven't been doing it up to now. So now is probably a bad time to start. And if you're going to be super sore, we don't really want that 
first couple of weeks soreness as you go into your peak prep for a race. So lifting day is not recovery day, but the soreness will improve. And if we integrate early enough, then it's not really going to affect your running all that much. Now, first, again, the first few months are just going to be focusing on the skill. You're going to be unstable. It's going to be weird. You're not going to know how to like brace your body as you press things overhead. Squats are going to feel very strange. You're going to round your upper back. You're not going to be able to shift your weight and your heels properly on a deadlift and then drive through your entire foot. You're going to try to squat it so your quads are going to hurt and you're not going to understand why like your low back is doing more work than it needs to be doing, right? Like we need to just find the form first. But once we find that, then we can start to move real amounts of weight. And once we start to move real amounts of weight, we're going to be able to make pretty quick progress. I think a lot of the time when it comes to lifting, a lot of us may hear about these like newbie gains or first timer gains and you will see that, but it's mostly a skill thing. You're not going to see a lot of physical changes. You're not going to see a lot of changes to your running. It's going to be this kind of kind of slow build for a couple of months and then it's going to take off because you're going to get a lot stronger. Now, if we look at positioning, I guess I'm not sure we finished our week. So just to make sure to touch back on that, you can either do your hard session in the morning and then do your lifting at night. That will separate it by a good amount of time that you can get some recovery in and actually put work into both and then have a good recovery day afterwards where you either sit around or take a walk or take a really easy run or do some cross training. And that'd be maybe say your workouts on a Wednesday and your long runs on a Saturday. Wednesday evening and Saturday evening would be your lifting days. You could also do it the day after both of those things. So if your workout's on a Wednesday and your long run's on a Saturday, or say you're doing back-to-backs, maybe you do those and then you have a lifting session on Thursday. And you're probably going to be a little sore from your workout, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much weight we move in the gym. It matters how much effort we put in. The weight specifically matters, again, if you care about barbell sports like Olympic weightlifting and powerlifting. If we're just trying to get stronger and build some muscle mass, then the number on the dumbbell or barbell is irrelevant. It just matters that it's heavy enough to create progress. So even though the weight would be slightly decreased after a hard running workout, it's, it doesn't matter, right? So we would see maybe your lifting would happen on Thursday and Sunday or Thursday and Monday, depending where it fits. Now, once we have the session and the week, how does this all fit into like the year? Now, I will usually try to target a few different like priorities throughout the year when it comes to strength training. One of them is heavy. And the reason I have people lift heavy is multifold. One, it's good for your bones, much like running is good for your bones, but this is good for all of your bones. It's going to be a big bone builder. There's nothing really better for you and your bones and the prevention of osteoporosis than one, eating enough, and two, putting a bunch of stimulus on them in the form of heavy things, right? So heavy lifting is good for your bones. It's good for your tendons. That said, it's also a lot of stress on your bones and tendons. So I try to put this in an off season because otherwise you're likely to end up with a tendinopathy, right? Talk to any power lifter, their elbow hurts all the time, all the time, and their knees tend to hurt and all sorts of shit because they spend way too much back squatting and bench pressing really heavy weights, and it's just a lot of connective tissue stress. So if we do heavy work for like three to six weeks in our off season, we will see a ton of progress. Your body will learn to move better as a unit, We'll get to move heavy weights. You'll probably feel fairly empowered because it is like somewhat empowering to tear a shitload of weight off the ground. And then we can move into different priorities. Next, I will often go into some kind of like hypertrophy thing because as much as like you're not going to get big, hypertrophy means muscle growth. And I just want to say that you're not going to put on too much muscle. If you do start to put on too much muscle, then you lift less. And that solves that problem. But most people try, most people who work, live, spend time in a gym, spend a lot of time trying to put on a lot of muscle. And they work very hard to put on a lot of muscle. And they end up putting on a little bit of muscle. It is very unlikely that you are going to be the one who works not as hard 
and puts on a lot of muscle. Unless you are genetically gifted, which again, the answer there is lift less, or you take a lot of steroids. So don't do either, don't do that, and then play with your genetic traits and you should be okay. Right? So we're going to spend a little time in muscle growth because no 90 year old has ever wanted less muscle mass. And this, instead of our heavy from like two to five rep range, we're going to be more in like the six to 12, maybe six to 15, but probably six to 12 rep range for a month. And then I'd focus on some sort of like rotation thing. So instead of a bilateral back squat, we'd really focus on like nothing but walking lunges, maybe elevate the foot on a Bulgarian uh, split squat so that's even less stable. And then we'd move to like power and speed. So we take away the front elevation in the foot, really make sure that we're leaning all the way forward in that foot on Bulgarians, maybe some barbell back squats, depending on how comfortable you are with them. And then from power and speed, we'd probably go into like some explosivity, really bringing those plyometrics to a peak and focusing on like pop before your A race, right? Like there's a bunch of ways to do this, but that tends to be the way I think of it from a yearly. And this has changed a few times over the past couple of years. So who knows if it will change again? Probably will as I learn more, but I think we're starting, I'm starting to see this like more minor integration of all of these things. I really like the seemingly more modern training idea of instead of just having these like very distinct blocks of training a little bit of everything at all time and just prioritizing a little differently, right? So maybe most of it's heavy, but we also have a like 12 to 15 rep range of a one arm pull down in order to really focus on scapular movement or something like that, right? And this is more advanced topics. It's why it's hard, but if we just take the basics of pick a few exercises for each of the muscle of the movement patterns that we've talked about in this session, make sure you can do them well and then move enough weight that it's actually difficult. Then you will make some progress and do it throughout your week in a way that it doesn't damage your running and you'll make progress on all fronts. And that's it. If you want any help in terms of these things, please reach out. I would love to help you. Um, oh, one more note is you don't, it doesn't need to be complicated to be effective. If you took, there's a thing called in strength training called the big five. If you don't know what these are, it's a back squat, it's a barbell deadlift, it's a bench press, it's an overhead press, and it's a bent over row. If you, fa if you did those, nothing but those and some ab work responsibly for years, you would be really strong and you wouldn't need a lot else. Probably need a little bit of like ab and accessory work for support purposes, but you could literally do nothing but those five movements with a barbell and just make a bunch of progress. A lot of people don't make progress in strength work, not because they don't know what to do, but it's because they overcomplicate it or they get bored. And instead of just doing the same boring shit that works, they try to do something new that's not very effective. Same kind of thing as we see with running, right? Like we know that doing the same kind of track workout, even if it's a little different or the paces are a little different or the timing or the increases or whatever, Longer repeats are going to help with lactate stuff. Shorter repeats are going to help with VO2 max stuff. It doesn't need to be this weird, detailed, integrated, absurd thing, right? Like just go out and do the same stuff harder and you will make progress. So now if you have any questions, please reach out, shoot me a message, DM me on Instagram or whatever. Uh, you're welcome to shoot me a message on Facebook. It won't, I will, I will not see it as quickly. And or like book some time on my calendar. You can go to my website, ofrance.com, click a little thing somewhere and it will say like fill out a form and then you can do that. I would love to talk to you. I clearly love to talk about this stuff as I have talked about the basics of it, for lack of a better term, for the span of almost three hours, I think. So if you want some help because you don't want to nerd out about it for three hours, I would love to be that guy. Anyway, I hope you have a great rest of your day and uh, go have some fun on the trails. That's what we're all here for. 
Thank you again for listening to the Trail and Ultra Running Training Podcast. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Just a reminder, nothing you hear on this podcast is medical advice, and you should always speak with a medical professional before making changes to your training or your nutrition. If you enjoyed the podcast or found it helpful, please leave a rating or review. It tells the algorithm robots that people like it, and that means more people will hear it. Or even better, just share it with someone who you think would benefit. If you prefer a video version, head to the Trail and Ultra Running Training Group on Facebook, or check out the Mountain Goat Endurance Coaching YouTube channel. Thank you again, and I hope you have a great next run.